Welcome back, and thanks for joining us here at Live Now from Fox. I'm your host, Carl Lahada. I want to get right into uh, some tensions in the Middle East as we continue to hear more uh, headlines, developing stories as the conflict continues to grow. Now, to do that, I'm going to bring in a straightaway retired Marines intelligence officer, host of the Strat podcast, Hal Kemper. Hal, let's start with some big news that we got just moments ago. So the United States apparently increasingly concerned after top secret documents showing Israel's plan for a potential retaliatory strike on Iran were leaked to an Iranian telegram account on Friday. Hal, what do we know about those documents? Well, it's a little bit shocking. Uh, uh, Carell, they, what showed up on was a telegram uh, website or co- telegram account, I should say. That's a social media account. It's used by, uh, so it's used here in the US, but it's used especially by Iran, Russia, uh, and a number of, uh, dare I say, nefarious state actors uh, for information. Well, it was a pro-Iranian uh, account that it showed up on, and it looked like what it was showing was uh, set, uh, imagery, if you will, satellite imagery from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, NGA, and also uh, what appeared to be transcripts of intercepted conversations and what it had on it was National Security Agency, NSA, which does signals intelligence. Uh, all the reports coming out on it right now uh, from you know, so far unattributed uh, U.S. officials makes it sound like this may have been uh, a genuine issue. I mean, this was not something that someone just fabricated. And of course, the question is, was it, was this, is this a penetration of U.S. intelligence somewhere? Uh, the other concern is, was it hacked? And, and I don't know which one would be more uh, concerning if there was a successful breach through a hack or if there was an actual mole or something in U.S. intelligence. Now, the interesting thing is that it has what's called the five eyes. Uh, it has re- you know, released to the, the countries that compose the five eyes. Of course, the U.S. being one of those, and then of Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand. And this is a, an intelligence, a special intelligence arrangement that goes back to World War II with how we share intelligence within those five countries. So when I'm looking at it, it does raise the question, could it have been one of the other members of the five eyes that was the source of the leak? Now, in Israel, their concern is that it, it's talking about all the preparations they're doing for the big strike in Iran. It wasn't specific as to targeting, as to what they're going to hit, but it does talk about that. It talks, it shows uh, preparations at different air bases. It talked about uh, different types of training they were doing, uh, a variety of things like that. Uh, type of ordinance that they might be using was kind of inferred uh, from it as well. Uh, so uh, Israel's probably sitting there saying, oh my gosh, uh, some of our planning and preparations have been compromised. And the other part is they're probably saying, well, they're really spying on us a lot. I mean, they're looking at satellite photos of what we're doing and intercepting our conversations. So I'm not sure how that's going to play at a uh, diplomatic level, shall we say, uh, of that sort of thing. So uh, it, it's it's going to be a big flap. I expect to hear more of it as the week goes on. So a U.S. official also told CNN that the deep is the leak, excuse me, is, quote, deeply concerning. And what's interesting is that earlier today, we did hear from the Secretary of Defense, Lloyd Austin. He's in Italy for the G7. And he had said that the U.S. would like Israel to scale back its attacks on Lebanon, particularly near the capital. But is that likely? And what kind of incentives does the U.S. have in order for Israel to scale back those attacks? Well, of course, the biggest incentive is that we, we're, the, we're the biggest backer of Israel. We provide weapons and all sorts of other uh, support to Israel. So, of course, we have that leverage, if you will, uh, with Israel in saying that. You know, that it got, kind of going back to the leak a little bit, there was some sort of Machiavellian uh, thought that maybe the U.S. or one of the other five members, five eyes members, may have leaked it intentionally in order to... Uh, do exactly what Secretary Austin was talking about, which is to uh, somewhat coerce Israel into scaling back the uh, degree of its uh, of its strike on Iran. Uh, I thought that was rather, uh, uh, well, rather Byzantine, to put it lightly, uh, that something like that was going. And I don't think that's where it was sourced from. I, I find that less likely than the alternatives. 
but uh, but that was being discussed as well. But there is a lot of concern with the U.S. and and some of our partners, of course, that whatever Israel does, that they might widen the conflict even further. And of course, the problem is they're seeing uh, nations in the Middle East, other nations like Iran, uh, certainly Hezbollah, which is not a nation but a uh, but a major uh, threat group in southern Lebanon, and Hamas in Gaza, that they're just they're not backing down. You know, Hamas is uh, still pushing forward, Hezbollah is pushing forward, and Iran may feel compelled to respond even more strongly. Sticking with these leaks and also what the Secretary of Defense had said, what does this tell us about how the U.S. feels on the trajectory of this war? Well, the fear is, of course, it'll widen the conflict. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, the, I think the fear, the, the hope was that when Sinwar was killed, that uh, this might be an entree to get some sort of ceasefire deal uh, put in place in the Gaza Strip. That's not looking uh, any closer right now. Uh, also, there was some hope that uh, certainly at the end of last week with with Lebanon pushing really hard and Hezbollah's uh, somewhat public acquiescence, that there might be a separate ceasefire deal for just southern Lebanon between uh, Israel and uh, Hezbollah. Uh, I don't rule that out, but uh, it does appear that certainly for Israel, they have a lot more things they want to accomplish from a military standpoint before they agree to anything. And the other problem is that there are certain stipulations of what that agreement would look like that that Hezbollah just simply is not there. You know, part of that is that they pull all their forces out of the uh, the area in the UN Resolution 1701, south of Latani River. Well, that has not happened. There's a disarmament provision of Hezbollah on that. That certainly has not happened. So there, there seems to be a long way to go before they could get to something where it would be a, a more permanent ceasefire uh, type arrangement, let alone peace, uh, if you want to call it that. I want you to talk a little bit about what was leaked in this document as well, because I do have the report here. Um, it was a report from CNN. And it says that the document described Israel moving munitions around and Israeli Air Force mm -hmm. exercises involving air-to-surface missiles, seemingly in preparation for an attack on Iran. Uh, given kind of these tidbits from that leaked document, what would that attack look like? Well, for, for Iran, they can certainly go back and figure out, okay, they're pulling this type, they're gonna use this type of ordinance, and they're doing this type of training, which means they're looking at these types of strikes, and certainly any target intelligence uh, uh, officer could go back and look at that and say, well, Based on that, I think they're looking at these particular targets. I think that's this is how they plan to prosecute these particular targets, depending on uh, the specificity of what's in there and certainly what they can, you know, they take from what they know to what they have now and what they can put together from that. Uh, certainly Iran knows where its potential targets, you know, things that, that Israel would like to hit, they know what those are. That's not an unlimited number of possibilities. And within that, they have certainly looked at how Israel might potentially try to strike those. So they already have a, uh, uh, dare I say, a, a template of how Israel might want to do that. So you take whatever you glean from these argument, uh, from these uh, documents, you put that, you apply that or compare it against the template of what you think or what they would think Israel would do. And that would narrow down the number of targets that uh, Israel would possibly be looking at. So you can actually glean a lot of information, a lot of intelligence from uh, uh, a limited uh, array of uh, information within the documents, not just what was leaked, but it's what was leaked in context with what's already known. And that's where, you know, basically uh, Iran would develop greater insight on, on what Israel wants to do. And of course the consequences are that they could shift around their air defense assets and put uh, uh, Israeli Air Force pilots at greater risk doing those missions because, frankly, they would have said, look, this is how we think they're going to come in. This is what we think they're going to do and take all the countermeasures that they possibly can in order to, uh, you know, mitigate that risk. And that's another way of saying trying to shoot down the Israeli aircraft. So there is a real human danger uh, when stuff like this comes out. There's a uh, 
there's a, a lot of things that certainly Israel is assessing right now. And Israel, and frankly, this leak will probably end up pushing things back because I would imagine they're going to go back and relook at everything and make some changes simply to create a greater degree of uncertainty with the Iranians as to how Israel plans to strike. Al, when we spoke earlier about you coming onto the program, this wasn't even the story that we were going to cover. So this is coming on the mm -hmm. heels of another headline that we're following. I want to showcase some video here that was uh, provided to us a little earlier today. And this has to do with a drone that was launched toward Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's house early on Saturday. That was confirmed by the Israeli government. Now, there were no casualties. Neither Netanyahu nor his wife were home. Now, this comes after Israel's war with Lebanon's Hezbollah has grown worse in the last couple of weeks. How? The first question is, how does a drone get so close to Netanyahu's house? I, I think that's the same question that Netanyahu's been asking uh, of the uh, Israeli Defense Force chief of staff, which is, how did a drone get so close to my house? Um, the question is, what is the gap in the uh, in the Iron Dome and the Israeli air defense picture that allows this drone to get into the you know to the prime minister's home, uh, and then on the heels of a drone, another drone strike that hit a military base where it killed four IDF soldiers, uh, seriously injured dozens of others, uh, hitting hitting this uh, mess hall, this uh, cafeteria, if you will, uh, when it was full of troops. Uh, a concentrated uh, troop target, if you will. Uh, how did it get in there? And then, of course, this falls, you know, some weeks after, or I should say a couple months after, the uh, Houthi drone that managed to go out and fly right into Metropolitan Tel Aviv. Again, theoretically, with the Iron Dome, none of these things should have happened, but they did happen. And so they're going to be looking at a number of things, which is the capabilities, the technical capabilities of the drone will certainly be looked at very closely. Uh, you know, seeing if the drone has anything where it's able to somehow fly in a more stealthy mode or somehow evade radar or any other detection before it gets all the way in there. Uh, so they're going to be looking at tactics, techniques, procedures that the uh, Hezbollah drone operators are using that they could get in this far. Uh, they'll be looking at, you know, timing of when the drone came in to see if maybe there's some gap tied to that. They'll be looking at a number of different things, but the big question is, how how are they able to pull something like this off? And of course, you know, you could extrapolate out and say, if they can hit the prime minister's house, who else could they hit? You know, if, if that's supposed to be a, a more well-defended property, I would say, than a, a number of other homes and properties in Israel. So the question would be, well, if they can hit here, where else can they hit? And and that's that really gets into the whole psychological dimension of uh, of warfare, which is uh, causing great uncertainty and uh, and of course uh, casting doubt upon the uh, the IDF and Israel's ability to defend against attacks like this. And then, how the next question is: What capabilities need to be in place to make sure that this does not happen again? Well, the one thing they're going to be looking at are, are drone countermeasures, all right, uh, anti-drone systems. You know, it's interesting, uh, you may recall this week, uh, we put a theater, uh, uh, not theater, terminal, uh, high-altitude air defense, THAAD system, uh, with 100, about 100 U.S. troops that we actually deployed into Israel. And a lot of people say, with their Iron Dome system, why do they need this? And it was to plug a gap with a specific ballistic missile capability. And they were saying hypervelocity ballistic missiles, which I always find a rather interesting term because most ballistic missiles flying at high altitude are hypervelocity because that's simply how fast they, they've always flown. Uh, but they're, they're trying to plug this gap with this U.S. Uh, uh, high altitude air defense system. Uh, and that was something they saw from the attack that just occurred in early October where some of the Iranian ballistic missiles, even though they were knocked off, you know, for the most part, knocked off track, you know, they, they had one impacted 500 yards from Mossad headquarters. They had a couple of hit a, uh, you know, an air base that had F-35s, our most advanced uh, fighter bombers that we provide the Israelis. So they needed to plug those gaps. And that was one thing. Now they're going to be looking closer to Earth, so to speak, 
which is uh, gaps in the uh, low altitude realm, which is where these drones are probably flying. Again, I don't know what altitude or what what trajectory these drones came in on. I don't know what their flight path. I don't know if they were doing something like Napa the Earth, where they were flying so low to the Earth that uh, uh, that they couldn't pick them up on radar. Uh, I don't know if they were command controlled or completely autonomous. Uh, so these are things that the IDF is going to have to figure out. It's something that Shin Bet, their domestic intelligence service, is going to be looking at very closely as well to try and find out everything they can about this. And then the other question is, even though they're, they're saying they're launched by Hezbollah, I can't rule out that they, they could have been launched from somewhere else. They could even be Hezbollah launched drones and maybe launched from a location other than say Southern Lebanon, maybe somewhere else. So they're gonna be looking at these things as well to try and figure all this, all this out and then figure out where are those gaps, what are those deficiencies and what do they need to do to to uh, to plug them, and uh, so that I, think, I think I don't know if you're going to see a Thad type solution for that, but you're going to see something happen, and I imagine it's going to be pretty big, pretty dramatic, and pretty fast. How that brings me to my next question, because I can't imagine that all of our viewers, including myself, are weapons experts, so to speak. Could you maybe give us a bit of a briefing on the different types of drones and which ones pose the biggest threat? Well, there's, there's different types of, you know, drones, there's a lot of different things of drones. I mean, when you get into uh, some of the larger drones that, that the U.S. flies, those actually look like, you know, almost like commercial airliners are so big. Uh, so we have drones, you know, the, 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 the Triton series and things like that that are used for persistent high altitude surveillance that fly, I'll say, 60,000 feet plus uh, above ground level uh, AGL. Uh, those things tend to be very large. And then there's ones that are in a medium spectrum. They're they're larger. The MQ-9 Reaper fixed wing drone, uh, we've lost a number of those uh, due to the Houthis, but we've lost them elsewhere in the world as well. Those are per fairly good size. Um, and, and, you know, the Predator-type drones, uh, certainly when I was overseas in uniform, uh, I was on the flight line uh, right next to those and got to see them up close and personal. And uh, so uh, they're... I mean, size is a relative thing. You know, I mean, are they bigger than a Cessna or something? Well, yeah, they don't look like a Cessna, but they, they have, you know, you get into wingspan and, and things like that. They're, they're pretty good size. And then you get down to smaller drones. And a number of these drones, uh, some of them are fixed wing. A lot of them are rotor, quadcopters, and things like that. And if you get all the way down to the very smaller drones, you get to stuff like you saw with the drone that went into the living room where Yaya Sinwar was sitting on a chair throwing a stick at it. Well, that drone, and I'm not entirely sure what type of drone that is, but that might be a drone that's uh, uh, akin to the Dragonfly series drone that, that we produce. And that's a drone that literally can sit on the palm of your hand. It's a very tactical drone. It doesn't have any weapons capability, but it's great for intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, at a very tactical level, like a squad or platoon, which is a small group of maybe a dozen or a couple dozen. Uh, it tells you what's in that building, what's over that hill, what's around the corner. These are very, very small drones. Some call them uh, micro UAVs, if you will, uh, which is micro unmanned aerial vehicles. Uh, very small, and I've seen stuff uh, so small that literally it looks like the size of an insect. Uh, some amazingly small drones. Again, not designed for weapons, although I. I have heard some other exotic applications of putting, using them for assassination stuff and putting a very small explosive charge. And there's an Air Force video I, I've had that I use in my training where it actually shows the drone landing on a terrorist head and then exploding. It's all done in cartoon, but you get the idea of what it does. And uh, so these are all within the area of theory of, of what's going on. This drone here was probably, uh, my guess, is a fixed wing drone that had pretty long legs. It could fly a, a pretty considerable distance, obviously had a warhead. And uh, and so they're gonna be looking at that 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 area of drones. But then again, that's why I say they're gonna have to go back and take a look at this. This might this drone may have come from somewhere other than Southern Lebanon. And they're gonna have to figure out if maybe this was a different type of drone that was launched from a different direction. Maybe it was launched within Israel, or maybe it was launched from within the West Bank or something like that. I don't have all the details. Everything they say so far makes it sound like it came from southern Lebanon, but more to follow. This is uh, kind of breaking news.
Al, given all the topics that we've touched on in this conversation, and it was just two major headlines, really, that we discussed, but is Iran preparing or are they ready for an all-out war with Israel? Corral, that's kind of interesting. The problem Iran has is they don't have any way to really do an all-out war with Israel. You know, uh, first off, if I could quote the real estate uh, saying, location, location, location. They have no border that they share with Israel. Uh, they've got a couple of countries between them and Israel. So, and they don't have a, they don't have a really uh, robust, capable, mechanized ground force with a lot of aviation support where they could do something that, say, the United States could do. They're not going to do something like we did in 2003, where they went up to bag, where we went to Baghdad. They couldn't pull something like that off. Uh, they're certainly not going to do something like Desert Storm. And I would point out when you're looking at the geography, you go, well, they would have to cover, you know, that times 10 to get over to Israel. So they're just really physically, they can't launch a ground war. There is really no conceivable way they could launch a ground war in Israel. So what you're looking at are missiles, planes, maybe ships. Uh, things are going to be a little bit more distant. They don't have any naval infantry capability where they could do any landings ashore, no, any way to project anything like that. They don't have any big airborne capability where they could drop troops into Israel, which would be uh, somewhat preposterous to even think of Iran trying something like that. So they're somewhat limited. Israel, on the other hand, has a lot of force projection capability. They, they could theoretically put boots on the ground in Iran, although Iran, I just want to point out, is an enormous country. It is huge. And it's also a long way from Israel. So they've also got a problem of uh, how do you logistically support such an operation? How do you get your forces back if you were to insert them in the first place? How do you insert them in the first place to get them in there? Uh, although they could do some things like we saw in Syria not too long ago, where they did a strike on a, it was an Iranian facility in Syria that actually created, that actually produced uh, munitions. And they went in there with special operations forces, did a raid on the ground, boots on the ground, and, and then covered it up with airstrikes and drone strikes as they were leaving. Uh, that's, that's very conceivable that something like that could happen in Iran. But I think right now what we're talking about is an exchange uh, for, for Israel. Uh, a lot of airstrikes is what I would anticipate using some of the advanced fighter bomber capabilities they have, like the F-35, F-16s, F-15s uh, that are provided by the U.S., uh, perhaps some drone capability. Obviously, things they can do in the covert realm with their clandestine services. And then the other side would be uh, what Iran could do, which includes drones, but really what we've seen this last time was mostly ballistic missiles. But I would say the problem that Iran's going to run into is that once, depending on what the target sets are that, that Israel goes after, it's going to have a seriously debilitated capability to project force with both missiles and drones uh, after Israel strikes. And I would not be surprised to see if that's one of the first things Israel does is basically uh, uh, to take out their ability to respond with uh, drones and missiles as a response to the Israeli strike. All right, Hal, I know that there's so many topics that we wanted to touch on today, but unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it at that. I always appreciate your time here. Hal Kempfer, retired Marines intelligence officer, host of the Strat podcast. We'll talk soon. Thank you, Quirrell. Of course, we're going to step away for a quick commercial break. I do want to bring up the three box that I have been showcasing throughout this conversation. So there on your left side, you are taking a live look at Tel Aviv in Israel. We also have Haifa in Northern Israel and the Gaza skyline. We'll be right back. 